let's continue our discussion of uh, states and political systems with Germany. Uh, to start with, uh, please go and watch the video lecture uh, posted yesterday on with the maps in which we examine how France and Germany have developed in parallel as neighbors but very differently. So, as we mentioned yesterday, you look through the maps and what you see is that, well, of course, uh, initially many different Germanic tribes. Key moment being, however, what Charlemagne. Charlemagne unifying the territory covering basically the entire Western Europe uh, up to today's Netherlands and Belgium, down to Northern Italy today, and so on, up to some, basically up to Central Europe. But the key moment is afterwards when his sons will actually divide that ter territory by, uh, well, they will split this one realm, and eventually, in se over centuries, uh, this split will also become a cultural political split, and you will have a fairly constant state on the western side, which will become France later, and a patchwork of various princedoms, bishoprics, and so on, territories, hundreds, thousands of them, uh, if you look on the map, um, and those will be the Germanic states. And so that is one of the key aspects of, uh, if you look backwards from today's Germany, is that you see that there is a history of fragmentation, or actually uh, particularism which means that there's a history of particular developments, particular distinct cultures, a patchwork of uh, political, uh, cultural identities in this, in this area. That's what you will see, and you go century after century, and that's what you see next to France is this patchwork of diversity. Well, guess what? <coughs> the Reformation, which is a key moment in the development of the modern state, what will become then the modern state and modern nations, what do you think it happened? Well, Martin Luther lived in one of these Germanic states. So, Reformation also will have a huge impact on this particular system because all these, Ill, all these princes, each of them will take a different direction. Uh, some will join uh, the new Protestant movement, some will uh, stay with the uh, Catholic uh, Church, and this will give rise to the famous wars of religion, which were not wars. No, Let's just stick with the fact that we we'll give rise to all these conflicts. But what will that do? That will all only strengthen this particularism. Because the solution found to the conflict, as we mentioned, with the Treaty of Westphalia, 1689, was to uh, give the right of the, to each ruler to decide the religion, i.e., basically the constitution, the basic philosophy of the land that he ruled. So what does that do? It basically strengthens this di uh, diversity, right? Because it reinforces these borders. It creates, creates borders that are, that are not only for particular, um, uh, uh, political, but also cultural. Because this would be Protestant, this would be Catholic, this would be Protestant, this would be Catholic, and so on. So that, remember, the Treaty of Westphalia was a moment when the uh, principle of sovereignty was re-emphasized, right? And what is sovereignty is the idea that well, from now on, let's consider these borders as um, uh, strong. <laughs> um, let's consider these borders as protected, right? Let's consider these borders as things that shouldn't be cr uh, shouldn't be crossed by ambitious rulers from the from the neighborhood in trying to expand their territory, right? So this idea of sovereignty given to each territory is, uh, is a redefinition, redefinition of the meaning of borders, in, in a way, in the Middle Ages. When we talked about this, when we talked about the rise of the modern state. So, the principle of sovereignty, well, when is it uh, basically re uh, emphasized? Right then, with the Treaty of Westphalia. So you have Reformation, you have this rise of the principle of sovereignty. So all this strengthened this division, this political, cultural uh, division. So couple of uh, centuries, uh, another century passes. On the western side, you will still have France as a fairly constant uh, unit with the reach of the central power was fairly unit, and there was a strong central power. What you have here on the eastern side, you have Germanic princedom, 
bishoprics and all those, you know, a patchwork of various political uh, and now religious uh, units and so on. So that's that's a constant through through history. And we mentioned then that um, in the 19th century, uh, the, the impact of the rise of this modern centralized state that was France and Napoleon's success, initial success, has a huge impact also on other states. And there is this also this, this rise of the idea of uh, the modern nation, right? That there is an us and we should, uh, you know, have our own state, right? Which, which wasn't there before. We talked about this already, so I'm going to cover it again. So, as, as mentioned, what would be the criterion for these units when they try to define who are we and what should be this new state that we're building? So the criterion would be obviously the ethnic criterion, the ethno-cultural, the linguistic criterion, because there is no existing border within which we can define whether the nation is whoever is inside. Right? They would have to basically collect all those who speak German, but not all, right? Because the Swiss aren't there and the Austrians aren't there. So it's a complicated process, but we have covered this. Basically, the German Empire, Germany itself, is formed in 1871 through a war with France in which Prussia, one of these princedoms, kind of forces the other princedoms to unify an effort against France, and by defeating that, it kind of imposes its, its power and its model on the rest of the princedoms and, you know, smaller uh, kingdoms and whatever, and this becomes the German Empire. It's an empire that's kind of, a, it's a federal, actually, arrangement. And this lasts until 1914, uh, World War One. Um, it was a very successful economically uh, empire. Uh, it was also successful militarily because it, it, it developed, it was just formed in 1871. By 1900, it was one of the most powerful countries in the, uh, on, on, in the world. So, you know, 30 years, that's something, right? But it was also threatening, as we all know, in World War One. It was a clash of empires at the end, in many ways, of the old order, right? In many ways, our history today starts after World War One. That's when the world, as we know it, kind of was shaped. But <coughs> what happens with the German Empire? It well, it stops being an empire. It becomes a republic, the Weimar Republic, and this is between the two wars. The Weimar Republic, which was called the Weimar Republic because its capital was in Weimar. It was again a federal state. It was a very democratic state, but it was a completely failed state. Because it was, had a wonderful democratic constitution, but it was completely lacking in legitimacy. Meaning it lacked the support of important groups in the population from the beginning. Because it was born in defeat. It was born from the defeat in World War I. It was born from the Treaty of Versailles which ended World War I, which imposed huge penalties on Germany. So basically it was born with a burden. That's not a good auspicious birth, right? And it was also born with the effort of only one part of the population. This is very important because it will make sense later when you see that today's Germany is a Germany in which nobody is left behind. Today's Germany is a Germany in which everybody needs to succeed together because otherwise there's no success. This Weimar Republic was a disaster because politically it was a democracy, it was wonderful, constitutionally and everything, but it was a disaster because it didn't have the support of the population. There was huge fragmentation. There's, there were uh, extremist groups basically trying to uh, take over the, the, the state, uh, left and right. Um, and most of all, it was economically unsuccessful. And this also, you, would, you know, makes uh, for a good explanation for why today in Germany the fact that the economy has to work, and it does work, is a key principle uh, actually embedded in the Constitution. Um, economic stability, they have learned from this. Let me give an example. Um, over just, uh, in the Weimar Republic, over just a couple of years, what happened? Uh, around 1921, um, let's say 1920, one US dollar was 40 German marks. Just to give you a sense of uh, how how bad the economy was, this is an example of inflation. So in 1920, US dollar, one US dollar was 40 marks. In 1922, two years later, one US dollar was 200 marks. Well, that's bad, but just wait for it. A year later, in 1923, one US dollar was 18,000 marks. That's inflation. 
a few months later, one US dollar was 4.2 trillion, which is, well, above a billion, right? So, one, the 4.2 trillion marks, that's one US dollar. And literally, they, uh, people were, were rolling uh, barrels of money, printed money, to buy bread. So that's inflation. That's unbelievable inflation. Right? So it, it gives you a sense of how the economy crumbled. And all this chaos, all these pe uh, groups pulling back in, in, in different directions and destabilizing the society, and all this humiliation felt from the uh, conditions imposed by the victors of World War I, has created uh, conditions for the rise of Hitler and for, of Nazi Germany, who, who promised to, uh, to reconquer, to reestablish the dignity of Germany, well, obviously more than that, right? But that was the gist of it, and to put order into things, right? He did that actually to a, to a degree. So that's, you need to understand that when you, you know, when there's chaos, think of Hobbes, right? The state of nature. When, when things are falling apart and you can't survive, right? You need someone to put order into things. Something, right? The Leviathan, right? So that's what happened. And obviously the Nazi Germany was even a bigger disaster. At the end of World War II, Germany was, um, didn't exist. You have to understand that this Germany that was founded only in 1871, with huge, you know, uh, and, and has gone through so many things, ceased to exist at the end of World War II. And it was considered to be the enemy of the world. I mean, think of the millions of people, 40, 50, 60, 80 million people who died only in World War II. And basically they were to blame, right? Germany, right? quote unquote, right? So, it was, you know, now we, you know, we obviously, you know, we point towards, you know, who are the enemies, you know, terrorists or whatever, groups, Al-Qaeda. This was, they were the, you know, the enemies who have caused millions millions of deaths, right? And it didn't exist, it was occupied territory. So it gives you a sense of uh, the dire situation and also the miracle of the fact that 10 years later, in 1955, the new Germany, the federal Germany that was established, the democratic federal Germany, imagine that, 10 years after being in ruins, literally, literally in ruins. If you go to Germany, you'll see that most bigger cities have been rebuilt from scratch. Um, ten years after World War II, Germany was already the uh, most powerful, economically powerful uh, state in, in Europe. So that's that's something. So what happens after World War II? Well, eventually, two Germanys are established. One under Soviet influence, that was the German Democratic Republic (GDR), which is uh, well, it wasn't democratic, but it was under Soviet influence, and then there's the German, the Federal Republic of Germany. And that's the democratic one, the actual democratic one. So under communist influence, Soviet imposed communist influence, and uh, uh, actual democratic federal Germany. And that's the situation from the 50s until 1989. And in 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, <coughs> and very soon the two Germanys reunify. And the, now you have one Germany. And they reunify so that the eastern part East, so-called Eastern Germany actually becomes just joins the, uh, democratic Germany. It does. It's not a new state. It's basically it's integrated into the system of the, this Germany. And this is a tremendously successful country, but which has learned from this historical um, experiences. And the way it is set up shows you the effects of these experiences. So let's look at the state of Germany. The state. Right? I always ask you, what is it? Unitary, federal, confederal, or what do you think this could be? Think of its history of particularism, of fragmentation. Well, of course, it is a federal state. Indeed, it is a federal state, and its units are called land, which is singular, or lander, which is plural. A land being one province. It has uh, 16 such uh, lander uh, based on historical uh, regions, uh, basically. Two of them are actually cities, are a land and a city, Hamburg and Berlin, are considered to be a city, land, city, 
uh, city and province in Myanmar. So 16 in total. So it's a federal um, uh, state divided in land, and each land has its own government, executive uh, branch, and legislative uh, branch. So history in action. This is why it's. And this is Germany right next to France, which is what? A unitary centralized state. That's unitary and centralized next to it, federal, barely, very decentralized dis 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 state. So, federal. Um, so that's the state. How about the political system? What sort of a political system will it have? Well, the importance of um, studying Germany before, well, it's important for many reasons, but also because it is a parliamentary system. Parliamentary system, just like in the sense of a model, um, like the UK, but not identical. This is why it's important to study because actually Germany is a model for many countries. Um, Russia, when it became democratic, adopted many things from uh, from the German model, and it's a very popular model around the world. Actually, so it's a parliamentary system, which means what? Which means that Parliament is the most important institution, the most important body in the political system, and all power comes from Parliament. Well, it, why would Parliament, why would they have such a system, not a semi-presidential system like France next to them? Because France's semi-presidential system, as we discussed, comes from the goal, from the need for, for a strong executive after the parliamentary system, the Fourth Republic, almost crumbled under the pressures of the civil war in Algeria, the decolonization, as we talked about yesterday. So why do they, why, but would Germans after World War II establish a strong executive coming after Hitler? Of course not. Of course not. They will want to give the power mostly to the people. This is why it's a parliamentary system. Because what are the parliament? What is the parliament? Is the, the, the gathering, the institutions where the representatives of the people are gathered. And they should be the ones who have most power, not a strong executive like Hitler was. You see, two neighboring countries, very different realities, political, cultural, they're, you know, remember that their very national self-definition is ethnic, while the French one is political. The national, uh, nation, French nation is defined politically, the German nation is defined ethnically. So again, right next to each other, right? And actually today, if you visit, you go across, there's no border basically, you just, just go across, and there are different political realities. Both, however, now part of the European Union, this is when there are borders. So it's a parliamentary system. Well, that's Let's then look uh, that, uh, at how, how it looks. So the most important body then is the parliament. There is a lower house. There is a one house. Will there be one or more? Well, because it's a federal system, federal state, you should guess that there are probably two houses. Indeed, there are two houses. Why? Because it's a federal state. Because the components of the state in a federal state are both the people and the individual provinces or regions or in Germany Länder, right? Land Länder. You always have to ask yourself why an upper house, right? Why two houses and not one? Why not three? Why not ten, right? One is enough if it's a small country, right? More homogeneous and so on. And we'll talk about different varieties of legislatures, but always ask yourself. Well, in a federal system, you need to wrap that federal dimension the components of the state in a democracy need to be represented, right? And what are the components of the state in a federal system? They're the people, and then they're the, the, the regions, just like in the US. If you read the Constitution, right, and then the Bill of Rights, the two elements that constitute the United States are the people and the states, which are basically regions, provinces. In Germany, the same. The two elements that constitute the state are what? People, and then the land. Why? The history of particularism, because they are different. Bayern is not uh, the same as, um, um, you know, um, uh, Baden-Württemberg, another, another land in, in Germany. So, two houses. The, <coughs> the lower house is called Bundestag, and you have in your book, in your chapter, the exact names if you can't decipher them here, so Bundestag, which means Federal uh, Assembly, and the upper house is called Bundesrat, which is Federal Council. The, uh, the lower house is directly elected by the entire population. We're going to talk, talk about the electoral systems, we're going to 
explain how they are active. But anyway, you, what you have to remember right now is that there are several major parties in Germany, not fragmented as in France, but five nowadays, five major parties. So they will need to form a coalition to have majority here. The upper house is not elected by the people, of course, right? They represent the individual lender, right? Provinces. And we're going to talk in a second about how the Bundesrat is uh, put together. Okay, so the, the legislature has two houses, so then it's a bicameral, bicameral two chambers legislature. So being a parliamentary system, who is the head of the executive, right? Remember from the UK, you have a monarch who is only head of state and you have a prime minister who is head of government and the most important political actor and leader, right? The same will be here, but obviously you won't have a monarch because it's not a constitutional monarchy, Germany, but it's a republic. So you will have a prime minister, which in Germany is called chancellor, with a cabinet, and you'll have a president. But here's the word why it's important that I keep saying this, and it's very important to remember, that don't be confused by what the name is, but it doesn't matter what you call it, be able to identify the function that it plays, right? So the chancellor is basically like the PM in the UK, is the most important person. But remember, this is a parliamentary system, which means that the only, the core of the system is the parliament, the representatives of the people, and being a democracy, which means that all other branches, all other institutions receive their power from the parliament. And that means that the chancellor is basically, who is the chancellor, who is the prime minister, is the leader of the majority party or coalition in the parliament. Uh, just like in the UK. So after an election, the majority here, the leader of the majority, uh, well, let's say the two parties in the coalition, the leader, leader of the larger party is asked by the president to form a government. It's kind of automatic, right? And then the chancellor will choose her ministers, heads of different departments. And remember, we're going to talk about the different branches and what they do and the meaning of each uh, in the next section. So, you know, don't, don't be worried if you don't understand exactly, but there's the, obviously the legislature and the executive, right? So the chancellor is the head of government, just like the PM is the head of government in uh, the UK. And just like in the UK, the power comes from the parliament. Then what is the president? What is the role of the president? Well, he is just like the monarch in the UK, he is the head of state, meaning represents the ongoing reality, as much as it is ongoing, of Germany. So it's a ceremonial symbolical. He signs laws, he's a moral authority, just like the monarch in the UK. And that's typical for a parliamentary system. There is this division of the executive into the symbolic head of state, ceremonial head of state, moral head of state, who is above politics, and the head of government who is actually in charge. But why is it in charge? Because the people have spoken, and the majority of them have created a government, and this is the government of the people. That's the logic of a parliamentary system. It comes from the people's will, uh, and then the parliament forms a government, just like in the UK. This is why you have what? A fusion of powers, not separation of powers as in the US. You have a fusion of, between the legislative power and the executive power. So, Clearly, when there's a new election, in order for uh, you also have a new government, unless the same majority wins, right? And it clearly then, the parliament can also remove the executive through, just like in the UK, a motion of no confidence. The parliament can pass a motion of non no confidence by which it says what? That we don't have confidence in this executive, right? And they, they have to resign because all of their power, legitimacy, comes from here, from this, from the voice of the people. So, um, how is the president, uh, how do you get to be president here, since it's not hereditary, like the monarch? Uh, there is an election, which I'm going to explain in, this, in, a, in a second, but the president is elected, clearly not by the people. That it, obviously, it's not going to be elected by the people, because remember, like I said yesterday in the lecture, being elected by the people in democracy means power, because that's the major source of legitimacy, the major source of authority in a democracy. Right? I represent the people. We think that right, in this model, democratic model, being the representative of the people is what puts you in the position of power. Right? So this is why you have the president elected in the US, which is a presidential system with a strong president, and in France, which is a semi-presidential system, again with a strong president. So 
whoever is recognized by the people, that's a source of power and authority because they claim to represent the people. So clearly not acted by the people. And I'm going to explain how he is, though, still elected. So let's talk about the Bundesrat, the upper house. Well, remember that right, Germany is a federal state with different lenda, and each of them has a legislature and an executive. Now, the interesting thing about the Bundesrat is that the roles of the two houses, remember what is the role of the legislature? To pass law, to represent the people or the units, to pass laws and to have oversight over the executive. These are the three major functions of the legislature in any democratic system. The Bundesrat represents the states as the states, which are states here, our provinces are called land, so don't call them states. How do they represent? Well, they represent them by, you know, each land sends between three and six delegates here, right? And these people are actually, depending on the size of the land, and these people are actually, let's say they send three, who are they? They're actually ministers, they're actually members of the cabinet, members of the executive in this land. They're members of the government of this land. So they are sent here basically part time. They're sent here because the role of the Bundesrat, obviously it's a parliamentary system, both houses are needed to pass a law, right? Laws need to be passed by both houses. But there are different functions. This is the house that makes the laws. Obviously, most laws in a uh, parliamentary system will come from the executive, because this is the, the, the body in charge of you know, pushing government, basically, running the country, push, setting the direction of the country, the head of government here, right? Just like in the UK, it's the PM who drives the country, right? Uh, so most laws will come from, from here, enter the Bundestag, or uh, here's where they're really debated, and then they're sent here to the Bundesrat, and what do these people do? Now remember, these people are those, these people are the ones who run the, each individual government in the land. So in each of these provinces. So they're the guys who, and girls who know how, what, how things work and what things work. Because remember, the land, the land, these provinces are actually very autonomous to, 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 to a good degree. They have their own policies in the economy, they have their own economic policies, their own cultural policies, so they have, you know, most of the governing happens here to a large degree. So who are these people? These are the experts who know what things work and what don't, they don't work in their own land. So when they, they go up, they go to Berlin to, to sit in the Bundesrat, then they, what do they do? They just tweak, they give expertise on the laws that come from, say, the Bundestag, and modify them so that they actually work. So they're the experts. Sometimes the government introduces the law first here because they want to see if we wrote it well. So these are the experts. This is why these people actually, um, you know, they're just delegates of the each individual land uh, government. And it's even, it's very interesting because <coughs> you have elections uh, here uh, periodically, but in each individual, uh, for the Bundestag nationally, right? But in each individual land, you have elections for the given government of the land at different times, in different years. So this is this year, this is next year in January, this one is next year in November, which means that the government in each of these lands changes. You know, every year there's a land where a government changes. But guess what? Whenever government changes here, they send a different bunch of people <laughs> to the Bundes. And this gives you a sense that these are just delegates of the, of the individual lender who are meant to be there as really just representing the land interests and to vote according to land interests. And obviously elections in each of the lands, just like you know, elections in the US for the uh, state uh, um, legislature for governing the state of Washington, right? Uh, it's party based, right? So you vote for the Republican, for the Democrat, whoever it is. So does it, uh, it's the same here in each land, which means that you have different coalitions in power in different lands, and they will form different governments, right? And thus will change the composition. So basically the composition of the, there are 69 of them, by the way. It's a small one, right? Uh, 80 million, 82 million people live in Germany, 69 only, it's only 69 in the upper house. So the composition changes con continuously depending on the 
change of the composition of uh, the government in each individual land. Uh, so politically, you have different compositions, but again, they're standard to represent the land. Another thing that shows you how they represent the land and not themselves is that, for example, this land, Baden Württemberg, has sent three people, that's their delegates, or three ministers in its government. They have to vote as a block. They can't just, you know, each of them votes for something else. They have to vote as a block because they represent the land, not themselves. So, federal, it's a federal state. And this is why both the states, meaning not the states, the provinces are represented. Let's just make be clear of what we're saying. So the provinces are represented, the land are represented, and the people are represented separately. And the land, the governments are represented, the people are represented separately, but both need to pass uh, legislation. But the one who drives, the person who drives, and the entity that drives the, the legislation, that drives governance, is and the most important actor in the German political system is the chancellor, sort of a prime minister, right? And the cabinet, and most policies come from here. So I remember again that, who are these people? The chancellor is the head of the winning coalition or party after an election. Who will the chancellor appoint to be ministers? Well, also important part people from these parties who form the coalition. So leaders from these parties that have the majority in the parliament will be represented here. The same as in the UK, only that in the UK it's basically a two-party system, or used to be. So you would have the winner in the UK, the winner of the election, will be the leader of the major party and he will appoint the other bosses from the party in the ministries, right, to run different important ministries, foreign affairs and so on. So this is how these positions are given. You see how different it is from the US system where you don't even know who the secretaries of various departments are. You don't necessarily know because they just serve at the pleasure of the president. That's a very different system where all the executive power is given to the president. Here, the executive power is a manifestation of the power of the legislature and it, it is a manifestation of the power of the majority in the legislature. And that's the majority, maybe let's say it's two parties, uh, they will send the representatives to run the country. Okay, so this is, uh, I, I'm still owe, I still owe you the explanation uh, how is the president elected, but clearly not by the people, but clearly he's going to have to represent the people, right? Usually in parliamentary systems, the president is elected where, because it's in the parliamentary system, the president is only head of state ceremonial. He is usually elected with a supermajority by the parliament. It's not quite so here, let's say with the two thirds, right? It's not quite so here because it's a federal system. So you could guess that the president is elected by the Bundestag and the Bundestag together. Close, not quite. It's elected by the Bundestag, all the members of the Bundestag, which is 400 or 450, I'd say, about that, that number, it fluctuates. 450, and an equal number of representatives from the, in the, each legislature of the Lenda, of the provinces, of the regions. So 450 these guys and 450 elected representatives from each from each of these provinces. So you see how the federal dimension also, you know, the people's representatives and then the each individual lenders' representatives together vote for the president. And again, they have to have a sort of a supermajority. But it just it just gives you a sense of that this position is, you know, it's meant to represent the state, the ongoing reality of Germany, and not politics. You can curse the Chancellor for the policies he or she implements, as you can curse the Prime Minister in the UK, but the President is above that, sort of a moral authority. For example, the current President is a former uh, Protestant pastor who was a dissident during communism in East Germany, and he was a figure, a major figure in the reforms that happened in Eastern uh, Germany in cleaning up the, situ uh, the morally the situation. So, you see, this is kind of where these, uh, the role of the president uh, is, it's a moral authority, uh, not a political figure. This is very political. So that's briefly what I wanted to tell you about uh, the German state and the political system, just to see another parliamentary system unlike the UK. And the next uh, video lecture also po that I will also post today, <coughs> we'll talk, we'll do a brief comparison between these different political systems 
just the models and to understand what characterizes each of them.